Yeah, how, when I say got here all by ourselves, I mean how many people did not rely upon community, family, ancestors, good luck, you know, transmitted to get here. We all got here in this moment who we are today because of sacrifice that other people have made for us. And so we always start out by calling, by naming our ancestors, by giving thanks for the fact that we've arrived, whether we are religious or not. Um, so in this moment, I want to give thanks to my ancestors. You'll get a chance to. Um, I want to particularly name my grandma's grandma's grandma. Her name, her slave name is Susie Boyd. She was kidnapped from the shores of Dahomey, West Africa in 1791. And she and many of the mothers in the community made this courageous and audacious choice when they knew they would be kidnapped to gather up the seeds of okra and black rice and molokia and cotton and braid it into their hair, believing against odds in a future of tilling and reaping on soil, believing in us that we would exist. And so I think about that a lot because it can be hard, you know? The political climate, it's tough to be a farmer, like all these things can be really hard and it's easy to give up. But I have to think if my ancestors were facing that situation and they were like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna braid some millet in my hair because I will have great grandchildren and they need this seed, then who are we to give up on our descendants? And so I invite you in this moment to think of an ancestor for whom you are grateful, who made a sacrifice for you. And I will count to three, and we will say their names really loud, like we mean it. Okay, you got their name? One, two, three. Sandra. 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 Thank you so much. I also want to name um, the first peoples of the lands. Um, and not in a trite way. I know sometimes, you know, if you've ever read, like, white skin or red mask, you know, there's, there could be this thing about like, we're gonna name the indigenous people, but we're not actually gonna do anything about the fact that all the land was taken. So I'm not about that. Um, our particular farm, Soul Fire Farm, is 72 acres, as I mentioned, in upstate New York. We're on Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican territory. Uh, folks were kicked out in the 1800s from that land. First forced to Western New York, then forced to Wisconsin, moved around a bunch of times. Completely dispossessed of their territories through war and trickery. Uh, genocide, biological warfare with smallpox, etc. And so what we've been trying to do about that is to build relationship with the tribal community, the tribal government. And the first thing we said is, you know, do you want your land back? Do you want to have a share of this land? Because even though our farm is black indigenous led, none of us are from that land. So we still are enjoying some settler privilege. We still are guests. And they were like, no, nah, we can't take that land and take care of it. It's too far from our territories now. Uh, but what would be beneficial for us is to have access to the land for burying our ancestors who are being uninterred through the mall development in the area. So their bones get uninterred and then they want to put them in a museum. We don't want that. We want their bones to go as close as possible to where they lived and be protected. So we're working with them to put an easement on our land right now for a burial ground. So the point in sharing that is, is it Powhatan folks? Is this where we are? Whose land are we on? Uh, what is it? Powhatan. Yeah. Powhatan. Thank you for helping me pronounce that. Um, so I think it's important wherever we are to make sure that we're making authentic relationships with the people who have the right to that land and doing what we can, whether it's a share of the harvest, a voluntary tax, an easement, a land donation, political support to make sure that we're honoring that. Because we can't be talking about land and ignoring the folks who took care of it for 20,000 years, right? And the last shout out that I want to give before we kind of roll into the content is to my team. I think sometimes we get caught up thinking that, you know, there's a such thing as a hero or such thing as a celebrity activist. And of course, no one can run a farm like a real, you know, commercial farm that's feeding the community all by yourself. Um, no one can do this work all by ourselves. And so I just want to shout out, you know, Larissa and Demaris and Letitia and Jonah and Nishima and Emmett who do this work with me, and while they can't be here today, they definitely are part of all the things we're going to talk about. Uh, a little bit about Soul Fire. Uh, we are built on the guidance and teachings of the Queen Mothers in Ghana, West Africa, um, of whom I'm a member of 16 years, and they, they give a lot of teachings. Uh, the Queen Mothers are spiritual activists. They're also like the OG community organizers. They do a lot of the farming, they take care of the orphans, and I was lucky enough to train with them, and one of their proverbs, one of their teachings is latte ete no no da, 
which is, you know, three stones make the cooking pot stand firm. So we do a lot of things in threes at Soul Fire. The way that we address food in our community is through three projects. The first and most important is we run an actual profitable commercial farm. It's a vegetable farm. We also do chickens for eggs and meat, uh, herbs, but it's all through a CSA model. So people subscribe, they call it Netflix for vegetables, and we box up all that food and we bring it uh, to folks' doorsteps in neighborhoods under food apartheid, neighborhoods where you just can't get fresh food, high poverty areas. And people pay a sliding scale, you know, so it's whatever you can afford. Some are paying more than market, some are paying less than market, so it works out that the farmer still gets paid. So this is like a typical box, you know, you get diversity of colors and flavors and your minerals and nutrients. And that's my younger child, that's my son Emmett, he's 13, on the delivery route, bringing the cookie white van all around town. Um, the second thing that we do um, is because we're growing all this food in a way that pays attention to food justice and also that pay, pays attention to Afro-Indigenous farming practices, which is going to be the focus of this session, um, it's important for us to teach that and to share what we've learned with community. So we run training programs for thousands of folks every year on farm. Uh, people, the, the sort of flagship is our Black Latinx Farmers Immersion or BIPOC Farmers Immersion. People come live with us for a week. They take classes, they do hands-on stuff, we do healing from the trauma that we've inherited from you know, slavery and all that. Um, so here we're just harvesting some cilantro in the program. Another picture of the program. Um, we also do apprenticeships, we have youth coming out. So a lot of different educational stuff, each one's each one. And then the third and final stone that holds up our cooking pot is the organizing. Because it's all fine and good if we, you know, feed 100 or 300 families and find it good if we train new farmers, but if we don't have land, if we don't have access to credit, if we don't have SNAP benefits, you know, all these essential things, you can only get so far. And so we're doing a lot of policy work and, and this very exciting uh, collaboration with indigenous community for a land trust that is receiving land donations and giving land back to the tribes as well as giving land back to black farmers. As y'all hopefully know, the land was taken from us too. And some of this uh, organizing work extends internationally. So we have sibling farms in Haiti, Puerto Rico, Ghana, and Mexico. And we send uh, volunteer delegations as well as resources to support the farmers in what they say that they need, not what we think that they need. So here is a, a one co-op we support in Haiti that is a peanut growers, like heirloom seed saving co-op. So here they are distributing and sharing the seed. Um, so all that to say, you know, in the uh, it's a little bit of a challenge doing the workshop before the keynote. So a lot of the, the socio-political context of the work we will talk about after dinner. What we're going to focus on in this session is really digging into the brilliant and incredible technologies that Africans all across the diaspora have contributed to biological farming. So we can understand um, that legacy that we stand upon. And then after dinner we'll talk a little bit more about you know, racism in the food system and undoing it. So to tee it up, you know, I mentioned my grandma's grandma's grandma, Susie Boyd, who was one of the seed breeders. And what really inspires me about this story um, is thinking not just about the, the seeds that they put in their hair, but also kind of imagining that as they were doing that breeding, they were encoding all of this powerful ancestral knowledge about farming, about living in community, about what their culture is. Right, so it wasn't just like, here is an okra seed. It was, in order for this okra seed to grow, this is how we need to integrate livestock you know, into our rotations. This is how we need to make sure that we're sharing capital so that you can actually afford the inputs that you need for your farm. So there's a way that braiding, and anyone who, who comes from a culture of braiding, you know that that's when stories are passed, that's when knowledge would pass. So, so I imagine our ancestors in these ships kind of holding on to all of that in their hair and I think about the work we do as carrying on a legacy of remembrance of what those seeds were and what that knowledge is. So what were those seeds? I want to ask you first, just to see what the room already knows. So if you're not sitting at a table with people, you're going to need to sit at a table with some people. Because for a few minutes, I would love you to discuss what are your black agrarian practices that you use on your farm or garden or even in your consumption of food? And I'm giving you some possibilities to get you thinking. So do you use any black agrarian practices in terms of the way you test your soil, the way you remediate damaged soil, the crops that you select and grow, the way you manage livestock, bed prep, financing your operation, the celebrations and cycles of the year, your tools, 
your food preservation or even your cooking, um, your land ownership structure, your technical assistance strategies, or your marketing. So I'm gonna ask you to take a few minutes, talk with the people at your table, answer this question. I don't know, it's okay too. Um, and then we'll have a few people share out just to get a sense of what knowledge is already in the room and then I'll continue to share some of the things I learned um, by making this my life work. Any questions? I picture here just to show cool. All right, go for it. our soil in my far hands when we first got on our farm and the soil now on our farm. And this is using all traditional techniques of how we improve the soil, which I'll get to in a minute. Anyone know who that image is of on the left? Cleopatra. Cleopatra, yes. Okay. Something to you like elementary school history thing. But Cleopatra was really into worms. In fact, she said the worm, she declared the worm sacred, and if you harmed a worm, you would be put to death. Further, she had a full group, like a cadre of priests, whose full-time work was dedicated to the study of the habits of earthworms. Recently, scientists have gone to like measure in the Nile you know, River area the worm casting content and found that it was 10 times that of Europe, on average, of Europe and the United States because she was doing large-scale vermicomposting. She knew that the fertility of the land and the harvest of the crop depended upon the worm. Not a new idea, right? These are some women in Ghana. They're making black earth called African Dark Earth. Been doing this for at least 700 years. 700 years ago is when Western scientists realized this was happening. What's so profound about African Dark Earth, it's like super composting. So it includes ash, uh, bone char, scraps from the kitchen, uh, you know, refuse from the fields, sort of piled up in this distinctive way. And it's such a common practice that you can actually measure the depth of it and tell it the age of the community because it's incumbent upon every generation to contribute to the depth of the dark earth. So these are the techniques that we try to do on our farm to improve it. This technique gets a really bad rap. Anyone know what this is? <laughs> slash and burn is called. More affectionately, Sweden agriculture. Right. So the idea with slash and burn, right, is literally you take a machete, right, chop up the stuff, you burn it, um, you have the nutrients in the ash, you plant, and then you move to a new space. The reason why it gets a bad rap and so unsustainable today is that so much of the land was stolen through colonization, that a system that's supposed to have a 25 year cycle. So you're like farming an area for a couple of years and you're not coming back to that area for 25 years, a whole generation has been reduced so that it's like one year here, one year here, back to here, right? And so you're depleting the land over time. But a proper Sweden agriculture system with people who have not been displaced from their lands actually sequesters 100,000 pounds of carbon per year per acre. So it's incredible because you have a root mass going down and that root mass is not disturbed by the burning. The root mass stays in place. So it's a carbon suck, constant carbon suck. The reason I put this up is, you know, a lot of us are not in situations where we can do Sweden agriculture and like take over, you know, <laughs> 2,000 acres. And, but this was the, the OG crop rotation, right? This is the original crop rotation upon which all other ideas of crop rotation uh, were generated. So when I plant my cover crops back and forth, you know, I think about this system as an ancestral system. In Haiti, we have the Jardin La Cou, it means the house garden. You have your tamarind tree, your moringa tree, your lemon tree, right? And then maybe some pineapples around the bottom, some rosso, some betty bear grass, some herbs, tomatoes and peppers all around and like chickens running through. Permaculture is not really a thing, y'all. Permaculture is taking indigenous technologies, clumping them together, and rebranding them to make a profit for so-called permaculture certifiers who are mostly university-educated white men. I'm sorry, I have to break that. <laughs> but all of these are very specific indigenous technologies, and it actually is disingenuous for us to clump them and pretend they're ahistorical. So when you see a forest garden, call it what it is, it's a jardin la cou, right? It is a Haitian technology that came from 26 different ethnic groups in Africa combining their knowledge 
to say what can we do that's adapted to this climate and still takes the layers, you know, and all the things, the permanent everything, multi-use permaculture. It's a jardin la cour. So here, this is a nursery that we helped to create in Haiti. Um, my mother's line is Haitian. And so these are some of the plants that are gonna go in so that everyone in the community can plant up their gardens. This is us making our own jardin la cour um, at our farm. But we're using another African technology called fanyaju. Fanyaju in Kiswahili means throw it upwards. It's terracing. Mm -hmm. Now terracing emerged simultaneously here on Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. So by the way, when I'm saying like these are African technologies, I don't mean like no other people in the world thought of them, but I do mean that African folks at least simultaneously originated them. So it's like no disrespect to indigenous folks, or including indigenous Europeans, indigenous Southeast Asians. A lot of us think similar, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but Fanyaju means throw it upward, because literally over time, what happens to soil on a hillside? <laughs> goes down. So when we got to our land, there was like all the soil, there was a stone wall at the bottom, and like the soil was up to the stone wall on one side, and then on the other side, there was like six feet, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we literally throw it upwards. We dig it, we put it back, and we build terraces, uh, which prevent erosion, it creates a semi-level space, and so first we have our trees, and now if you look at it, I don't have an after picture, but we have like 20 different herbs and things growing around the trees. Little demonstration kind of plot for our education. The picture kind of gives it away, but what do you think is the most commonly used agricultural tool in the world? Uh -oh. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I love hose. <laughs> I love holding my shirt off. Um, all right, I'll tell you this funny story. That's a little, there's no children, right? Okay, so I literally love hoeing with my shirt off. And we used to be like just a low-key family farm. People didn't come over. And so, you know, it's hot in the summertime and there's no need for all the extra clothes, especially if you're just like cultivating a row or doing something like that. It's not dangerous. And so I would just, you know, just wearing my shorts and nothing else and like hoeing. And this school bus full of Williams <laughs> College students, like freshmen on their freshman experience, just roll up. <laughs> so I was kind of like, <laughs> like ran around back in the house. And then when I came out, they just wanted a random tour. And now we kind of like Joel Salatin, we consolidate that. Um, but the whole time I'm talking, they're not looking at my face. All the boys are like, hey. <laughs> oh, hold with your shirt off. That's a long story. But the hoe is like the most widely spread. It's an African tool, widely spread, most versatile. You can use it upland, downland, wet, dry, all seasons. You can pretty much make it do anything that you need to do. These kind of hoes that you get at Home Depot, they're not great. Like the real legit hoes. Uh, that you see in West Africa and Haiti weigh about four times as much. They're huge and heavy. And anytime I'm traveling, I try to bring many back in my luggage, mm. which means I have interesting time at airport security. <laughs> um, but they do the job. You can do primary tillage with them. You can't do that with these little things. Mm. Irrigation. That's important. Started in Egypt with basically basin irrigation, which is when you dig out these basins, right, and then you have channels and it, it floods, very, very effective. Um, but even the more, quote, advanced irrigation, like the Fogara, that comes out of the Sahel Desert. Those systems, some of those systems are five, seven, 10,000 years old. These very, very old systems. And there's a few that are still in use today that uh, irrigate the date palms. And it's literally these channels from like miles down that help guide aquifer water, you know, throughout the whole community. The oldest livestock is the guinea hen. It's actually the very first uh, fossils of guinea hens are three and a half million years old um, yeah. in sub-Saharan Africa. But guinea hen is not the chicken. I don't, we don't have guinea hens yet because they're loud and we're trying to figure out if we can handle that. We probably will just to make the point. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, black people have chickens about a really long relationship. Um, you know, in Egypt they raise chickens, and so on and so forth. They've been a very common uh, part of the of, of livestock of the landscape. And the idea of rotational grazing was documented, you know, throughout Africa. So having your cows or chickens in one area and then planting on top of that area and so forth. That back and forth um, is very old. One of the reasons we have such a close relationship with with chickens is actually during enslavement or post slavery. Black folks were not allowed in many counties, um, in many states, to raise any other animals. Mm. So it was forbidden to raise like pigs, 
um, cows and so on and so forth that was reserved for the white farmers and but chickens were unregulated mm. so there's some really interesting like as I was digging through the records of, like the Jefferson family you know for at Monticello ordering this many pounds of chicken from the black folks mm. uh, because that was the only thing they were allowed to raise but of course you know we always reclaim the thing that we are allowed to do and kind of make it our own oh I'll mention two pigs even though we don't raise pigs either my husband's Jewish there's nothing we're trying to figure out but, um, <laughs> do we want to raise pigs? Again, we need to make a point. Because you, you all know what happened in 1804 in Haiti, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Then we have to go back to 1791 in Haiti. So, Haiti was, I mean, all slavery was brutal, but scholars would generally, generally agree that Haiti had a special type of slavery. On average, when folks got to Haiti, they could expect to live eight more years. Because econo the economic logic there was that it was actually less costly to bring new folks from Africa than it was to keep people alive to have babies for the next generation. So almost all the enslaved Africans in Haiti were first generation. They had just come up. <coughs> so this was an advantage and disadvantage. One of the, the, the living conditions were so brutal. I mean, it was all sugar cane. Um, punishments were very severe for acting out. I won't, yeah. I'll cry, so I'm not even going to say like how severe, but imagine the worst torture that you could do to people. Um, but people were not um, born into slavery. They, everyone knew what freedom was, and so the resistance was really strong too. So in 1791, a bunch of folks snuck off the plantation, went in the woods for a ceremony, and they were like, we're either going to die you know, fighting, or we're going to get free. That's, that's it. Like We're done with this whole situation. But we're up against the strongest army in the world. Napoleon's army is no joke. The French are no joke. We have machetes, we have fire, we need more. And so they actually, in that moment, brought together all their religions, all the different gods, all their belief practices, and they called on Esselidantor, goddess of motherhood. And they offered her a black pig, the Creole pig. And she gave her blessing and said, you'll win. You know? So that pig has become very, very sacred to Haitian people. Because they went on and won. Mm -hmm. It was the first victory. It inspired all the revolutions all across the diaspora. Mm -hmm. It terrified Europe. It terrified the United States because here's a, just a ragtag band of enslaved Africans and they beat Napoleon. Like, what? <laughs> they, they established the first free black republic, the first nation in the world to outlaw slavery on the books. Mm -hmm. And Haiti's still being punished. So that's an aside. But the point mm -hmm. is, the pig is sacred too. And we've always had like integrated livestock systems. So again, not a new thing. Not the idea of pastured livestock and integrated systems. Oh, wrong way. Food preservation. This is in Burundi, where this person is pulling a tomato out of a box of ash that is seven months old and fresh and firm. Mm. So smoking, drying, preservation by burial, and preservation by ash, all these technologies, thousands of years old African technologies. The raised bed, we talked about the Obambo people, one of the first documented folks, this is Namibia area, um, to make raised beds. And, and many of us use raised beds, they have so many advantages, you get warmer soil earlier in the season, you control your water, you know, we have heavy clay, waterlogged soil. Um, so I'll tell you this quick story about raised beds saving our farm. It was, was 2013 Hurricane Sandy? I think that was the hurricane. I'm losing track because climate change is off the chain. But I'm pretty sure that was the one and it like devastated a lot of farms in our area. So we had gone to sleep, there was the hurricane watch. You're not supposed to get hurricanes even in upstate New York at all. But um, we had gone to sleep and in the middle of the night, my husband and I woke up because we heard what sounded like a Mack truck coming through the forest. Mm. That be? And we look out and it turns out there is a river where there wasn't one. Like literally water pouring through the forest, over through the trees, like mm. onto the farm. Mm. And it's just gonna wash all the beds right down the hill. So we wake up our kids who were at the time, see five years ago, so they would have been like ten and eight. And we put shovels in their hand and we're like, we're trenching. We gotta <laughs> we have, like, headlamps, we're gonna like trench this water so at least it avoids like our most precious crops. Mm. In the morning, we wake up to go assess out the damage, and my son was hilarious. He was afraid he was going to drown, 
in the water. <laughs> so the pictures of him, he's wearing a life jacket <laughs> while he walks, <laughs> while he walks around the farm. We're like, it's only this much water. Um, <laughs> but what was really amazing, of course, is because we have these semi-permanent raised beds, for the most part, the water channeled itself and was like infiltrating rather than just coming down. And a lot of the farms who just did rows and were pretty heavy with their tractor use, you know, just lost their topsoil. They were down to this gravelly bedrock. So it's important for a lot, a lot of reasons. Yeah. Can you get some the No, go ahead. Talk about it. Leaves on there is neem leaks, uh, and neem, as we know, a lot of us use neem, uh, so they're anti-nematicide uh, as well. So for those that think you're probably planting what, cassava there or some type of root vegetable, so to prevent nematodes, they will put neem leaves inside the raised beds as well to prevent nematodes. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And anyone can chime in because this is great. We learn from each other. We add things in. It's awesome. Um, you were talking about getting together and helping out with the sugar cane, right? Yeah. So this idea of the dokwe from the homie or the kombi from Haiti or the work party, mm. this is a very important technology. So remember, our technologies are not just what we do with the physical thing, right? It's also how we are in community. Because it's very difficult. Farming is hard work and it's lonely and it's tedious and you're going to slow down if you're trying to do it all by yourself. And so what if on Saturday, you know, I go plant beans with you all and then you come to my farm the next time and then our harvest is staggered so we can help each other out. The host provides the music and the soup, right? And this is how farming has been done. Um, you know, we've adapted this on our farm. We have our monthly beat, and so everybody can come. We make a big pot of chili and, and we get a lot of work done. Microfinance, the susu. Mm. This comes mm. out of Sub-Saharan Africa. This is a women's technology. It is the proto-credit union, mm. where we pool together our savings, and then on a rotation, you get to take out a grant or a loan from the collective. A no interest grant or loan from the collective so that you can furnish your market stall, so that you can get a new tool, so you can replace the dead cow, you know, whatever it is that you need. The idea is that we pool our money together and collectively we've provided insurance for each other, we've provided mortgages for each other and so on. And it's just one of the first uh, black credit unions in the late 1800s is, is up above to show the way that we've carried on that legacy. Here we are looking like fools, what happened? Um, <laughs> So this comes out of, again, back to the Queen Mothers in Ghana who were nice enough to teach me some things when I was snot-nosed and eager and naive. But one of the things they said to me, they had a favorite thing where they'd call me in to like fact check a weird American culture aspect. You know, so like some of them would be like, they'd be whispering, I come in there, okay, I meet today. Is it true? You know, that they call me Amita Day, which means Saturday born first girl. Like, is it true that the United States, the woman will be stirring the soup pot and the men will be tasting it? And I'm like, yeah? And they're like, ah! You know, I'm like, you're both in the kitchen. So some of it was funny like that. But there's one, one time they call me and they're like, Amina Day, is it true that in the United States you plant a seed and you do not pray, you do not sing, you do not dance, you do not say thank you, and it grows? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. They're like, no wonder y'all sick. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true, right? It's true. Because the earth is not dead. The earth is not a material thing. She's a living, breathing system yearning for reciprocity. Mm. And so the very important part of the teaching was like, you have to recognize that this is a consensual and mutual relationship of respect. So we do talk to the plants, we do sing, we do dance, all of these things make a difference, not just in terms of like the physical yield, but what kind of nourishment are you getting from that crop? Uh, so this is us during our, one of our uh, BIPOC farmers immersions. You know, we're like, oh, we just planted, take out the drums. <laughs> they warm up to it after a little while. I see everyone got into it at first, they're just watching me, but they got into it. Anyone ever call cooperative extension? <laughs> Me too. 
Booker T. Washington Agricultural School on Wheels. What? Mm -hmm. Who thought of the idea of having agricultural experts not expect you to just come to the university, but to actually go out into the community and share the knowledge? This came out of Tuskegee University, this black college, right? That was very, very focused on the upliftment of the black farmer. And they came up with this idea of the movable schoolhouse. It was the proto extension agency. Anyone ever um, do like pick your own apples, or strawberries? That's the thing with farmers, you were like, why would you do that? <laughs> but most people, that's a thing, right? You like go on the weekend with your kids and you pick some apples and you get an apple cider donut or something. Or maybe in Virginia you don't have apples. Do you have apples? Yeah. 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 You have peaches. Can you pick your peaches? We <laughs> no, no. got apples. Georgia. <laughs> I'm like, how warm is it here? So, <laughs> Booker T. Watley, also at Tuskegee, was noticing that you know, farmers were really struggling just trying to do row crops. And so it was very innovative. And some of the ideas he came up with included Pick Your Own and included the CSA, called a Clientele Membership Club. And the idea was that you get these city folks who are feeling disconnected from the land. They buy a membership to your farm. They get wholesale prices. You have a guaranteed market, and so on and so forth. Um, one of my favorite passages from this book that he, he wrote about you know, making money, is he's like, but you have to foster a, a feeling of connection with the farm. So I have this idea that you create a newsletter, right? And then you tell them like, what's going on in your farm. And for me, in my world, that's such a common practice. Like everyone has a blog or a newsletter, or some way of making your customers like, know the inside scoop. But that was a new idea at one point. Anyone use cover crops? I hope so. <laughs> especially leguminous ones. Right? Legumes are magical. They take nitrogen out of the air and because they have a cool collaboration with rhizobial bacteria with a little bit of a trade for like a nice house and some sugars for some nitrogen capture, they're able to make organic nitrogen. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And we can thank George Washington Carver for that technology. It's not like we didn't know about legumes. But this idea of having legumes in your system as a soil conditioner, as a fertilizer, essentially, this is really what he popularized. And people thought he was off his rocker. Because they're like, plant something that you don't harvest for food? Like, I don't have the space, I don't have the time. And he admonished, you know, black farmers in particular, he was like, y'all lazy, because when the fall comes and your harvest is done, you're just going and chilling. And what you need to be doing is going to the swamps and taking out the muck. You need to go to the forest and take out the leaves you're going to spread them all over your farm and they're going to turn into compost and that's how you're going to you know revive your soils and stuff so all these things like all these organic farms we always use compost we use cover crops but this was really him pushing um, and many consider him the father of organic or regenerative agriculture because he was one of the first if not the first he was a generation before rodale right using his position as an agricultural faculty member to put these ideas out into the community mm. They're old ideas, they're indigenous ideas, right? But he was the one teaching that as a system, as a farming system, which he called regenerative agriculture. Anyone interested in like co-ops or land trusts, communal land ownership, right? Because this whole idea in the 1400s in Europe of enclosure and private property and no more commons, that, always, that hasn't been how it always is and it probably is not the way of the future. Right, the idea that you can own a piece of the earth or a piece of the sky or a piece of the ocean. It's like, what? So this is the way the Sherrods felt, Shirley and Charles Sherrod. And so they traveled around the world trying to figure out a different way. You know? And they came up with the first ever community land trust in the United States in 1969. Um, 5,700 acres in Albany, Georgia. 500 black families involved, they had a farm, intentional community, all of this. And, and the idea of the community land trust is community control, permanent protection, and a separation between the ownership of the land and the ownership of the structures on the land. So you can still build equity in your structures, but the land itself is accountable to community. Really brilliant. It's the best way I've ever seen to adapt like an indigenous framework for land use to what we call white man's law. So like, how do you make those things fit together? Of course, you know, we'll get into this more in the keynote, but they were shot at, their offices were bombed, they were kicked off their land, but that's to be expected. Um, Dorothy and Philip Barker, Operation Spring Plan, they started the first food hub in the United States. The idea of a hub is when we aggregate our 
crop, right, so that we can access bigger markets, wholesale markets. And this started in the black church community. Um, what did they call it? They called it like, shoot, it's shed something. It's like the church, basically the shed behind the church is where the farmers would bring like all their produce together and then they sell it to the church community and if they had too much, they'd bring it to another church, sometimes as far as Chicago. Uh, because the Great Migration would connect cities, you know, so all of the all of the cities down south kind of have their corresponding city up north, and so they fill up the truck and they bring it to the church. Uh, but this expanded to the idea of the food hub, and now food hubs are hot; they're like a big thing, right? Uh, but this started in the Black Church community. What were their names? Dorothy and Philip Barker, but Dorothy with an A. If you want to Google it, this one is really personal and close to my heart. Um, and it, it crosses over into urban ag. Is anyone an urban farmer here? Oh, a bunch of you. What's like one of the first things you have to think about when you're about to start a new urban farm? Soil, soil toxins. Soil toxins, exactly. So I didn't realize how awful it was. I just was kind of naive. I I'm a young mom, so I was 22 when my daughter was born and I was doing urban ag in Worcester, Massachusetts and I would just bring her, you know, and so we, we were renovating vacant lots, we were starting city farms for the youth, like doing all this, Awesome organizing, we thought we were great. And then I bring my daughter to her, was her 12 or her 18 month checkup, and she has blood lead poisoning mm -hmm. from exposure to the soil in the gardens. So of course I'm like totally freaking out. Like my baby's lead poison, you know, we did all the things like to chelate her and fix her up and, and take care of it. But it turned me into an activist for soil health in the urban areas. I started going around and testing soils. And for those who don't know, like the, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, safe limit, which is still high, is 400 ppm in the soil. So below that, you can kind of mess with the soil. Above that, not. I was finding 11,000 ppm in the drip line of people's homes and in playgrounds. 11,000 ppm is super fun. That's toxic waste site, according to federal legislation. It's totally ridiculous. Like, no contact, no one should even be walking through there, never mind children playing. So we started this organization called the Toxic Soil Busters, uh, these youth are actually wearing hazmat suits, they, they're trained, and we went around like remediating and fixing, we got a contract with the city, it was a youth-led business co-op, super cool model, but we got contracts with the city to like fix up the playgrounds and the vacant lots and all these things. Um, why is this African? Thank you. <laughs> why is African is because, ironically, powerfully, whatever, one of our most effective tools for cleaning up soil was a plant called the pelargonium. It's a scented geranium, it's an African flower. Mm. And it's a hyperaccumulator. So if you, if you, you have to acidify the soil for it to work, so you, you have to fence it off, so don't try this at home without really knowing what you're doing, because you actually make it more dangerous temporarily. So you chelate the, the soil and then you put the plant and it sucks out the lead, which is an element, it does not biodegrade, so no mushrooms, no bacteria, none of that works. I'm just saying all this because people made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and then you actually have to put that plant in a hazardous waste site. And it, sometimes it takes a few years to clean the soil. Um, doesn't work for every site. You know, other sites we would do like permanent raised beds or we would just not use them. Um, but the point being like the power of this situation where black youth especially are experiencing these neurological damage, developmental delays because of the lead, um, that it's this African heritage plant that's Part of the key to, to healing was was a pretty powerful woman. What was the name of that geranium? It's called the Latin name is Pelargonium. It's scented geranium, and the cool thing is it grows by cuttings, and it smells really strong also. So if you went to our apartment back in the day, we had like cuttings of geranium on every surface. People come to the house and be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to plant it by seed. Like one little leaf will become a whole plant. It's pretty cool. Uh, so I want to. Stop talking at you for a minute and give you another chance to just talk amongst your tables, just two or three minutes. After what you've heard, I'm curious what is arising for you in terms of how we can do better, you know, as a community in terms of showing respect for the black agrarian tradition um, and how can we carry on the legacy of these ancestors who braided the seeds, braided all this knowledge, passed it down to us. So take a couple minutes at your tables, we'll share out and then we'll have a chance for some questions.